Thank you. I want to start by thanking the organizers to give us this opportunity to talk about our molecule, which is now moving towards clinical trials. We are new to the field. This is our first Dravet Foundation meeting. We're super excited to be here. Um, I will be talking for 20 minutes, but I actually hope that the reverse interaction where we hear from you will be multiplied by many factors of 20 minutes. So um, if you have an opportunity to, to speak with us, my colleagues are sitting right there, please, please do this. We want to learn, learn from each other. So we are back are still in the genetic area of medicine. And I want to start by talking specifically about antisense oligonucleotides, because this is a modality that really takes advantage of some fundamental biological properties. We have heard from Veronica about DNA, messenger RNA, and protein, in this case, SCN1A gene, and AV11 uh, protein. DNA produces RNA. DNA is double-stranded, as shown here, and as a matter of fact, on the beautiful Dravet butterfly. RNA is single-stranded, and that makes it amenable, or, or dare I say, vulnerable to a particular type of interaction, and that is antisense oligonucleotides, because these antisense oligonucleotides will pair very specifically with specific pieces of RNA, and in the case of what we want to do, inactivate it. And so this is a modality that people have used. It is approved in a number of diseases, has a lot of uh, benefits. The one disadvantage is that um, so far there is no oral antisense oligonucleotide pill. They have to be given via other routes of administration, which in this particular case will be intrathecally, so directly in the spinal canal. How do we apply this now to Dravet? Well, we've heard about haploinsufficiency, one good gene producing sufficient amounts of uh, the protein, the other not so much. So we, we think of this as, we sometimes think of this as being a switch, on or off, but genes are actually more like dials. And what we find for SCN1A is that in um, the natural conditions, other parts of that gene or the immediate vicinity of that gene produce RNAs that do not code for protein. It's just RNA. But it tends to inhibit the function or the expression, I should say, of the SCN1A gene. And how does it do this? It does that by attracting inhibitors. So that's what's shown here on the slide. You see the, the DNA. The regulatory RNA is shown as that black curve and that attracts inhibitors. And so the net result of this normal condition is that your SCNA expression is somewhere in the middle. It's not off, it's not totally on, it's somewhere in the middle. And so that means that we can interfere with this inhibition by developing that antisense oligonucleotide that will have this superb affinity for interacting with that regulatory RNA and blocking its function we now find ourselves in a situation where we inhibit the inhibitor, we block the blocker, the net result is upregulation. And so the dial goes a little bit more to this side. And so one of the particular attractions of this is the word specificity, which I've already used. An antisense oligonucleotide against this part of this gene will typically not interact with this part of that gene. And I will actually show you some data indicating um, that this is really true. It's also an approach that only works if the gene is already being expressed. All our cells have the same genes, but some parts of the body express um, different proteins. For instance, clotting factors are only produced in the liver, even though your brain cells have the exact same DNA. So <clears throat> this mechanism where a drug really has to get close to the gene and the RNA really only works in those cells where that is already happening. So it's very selective for the cells where it needs to be. So the particular attraction of this approach in Dravé is, as a haploinsufficiency disease, patients already have about 50%. 
So if you can turn that dial from 50% to 70% of normal or 80%, um, you're, you're, you're getting quite close to normal. So this is not one of those situations where you need to have a tenfold increase. If you double it, you're back to normal levels. And we actually have data showing that even a modest improvement over that 50% can have a big impact on seizures. <clears throat> A final point is that this is really driven by the expression of the healthy gene, and so it's totally independent of the mutational type of the affected gene. And so this would be for all mutations in the CN1A gene. <clears throat> That's theory. Let's look at data. In SCN1A, there is a particular form of regulatory RNA that is called a naturally occurring antisense transcript, NAT. So when I use the word NAT, that's what I'm referring to. It's a regulatory RNA that is produced and that tends to dampen the expression of SEN1A. <clears throat> and this exists in humans. That was the first thing we needed to check. <clears throat> we find it in humans, and where do we find it? This is a whole range of uh, human tissues. You find it in the brain, <clears throat> and you find it in the testes. And now you will ask me, what is it doing in the testes? Why is it in the testes? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I've worked in the field for 20, 25 years, and um, we encounter this a lot. A lot of proteins and, and messenger RNAs are expressed in the testes, and, and nobody has ever been able to really figure out why. So um, effectively, we consider this to be selective to the brain. The little text in orange at the bottom, I think, is very fascinating because it tells us that you only have typically one of those nets per cell. So that indicates that these are powerful molecules. If you have only one per cell and it has an effect on the functioning of that cell, that, that's, a pretty potent, that's pretty potent stuff. But that also means that we really have to get only a couple of molecules of our drug in the cell to block that one inhibitor. So this means that you don't really have to flood the system with huge amounts of drug because there's only one of the target, which I think is very encouraging from a biology point of view. So then how do you go about making drugs for this? Well, you find your SN1A gene, that's there in black, you find the sequence of that net, shown in orange, and then you design different little oligonucleotides that sort of cover the different parts, and then it's empirical. You check when one of those works best, and we found one, I show you here, one that in a dose-dependent manner increases the levels of SCN1A. This is a good time to tell you that this drug has gone through a bit of an odyssey, a bit of an itinerary. It has changed names several times. But unless I tell you otherwise, I'm talking about the drug that we want to use for patients. As a matter of fact, the main exception is in the mouse, where we use an analog or homolog of um, this molecule we want to use in humans. I talked about selectivity and specificity. Here are some experiments that really show this. If you look at the panel on the left, this is fibroblasts derived from Dravet patients that were treated with our molecule. It's indicated our CUR 1916, but it is um, the molecule. And you see that light gray bar going up. That is expression of SEN1A. You see a lot of little darker bars here that are low and stay low. These are other genes that also start with SCN. 8A, 9A, very closely related structurally, but they don't move, so very selective. The middle panel is a neuroblastoma cell where we have even more of those SCN genes, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, only 1A goes up. The final panel to the right is the monkey cortex, that's the, the, the part of the brain um, um, that we're interested in. And here we look at two completely different genes. <clears throat> so SEN1A, as you see again, goes up when treated with the molecule. ACTB stands for actin, and that's just a housekeeping gene that you find in a lot of um, cells, that's active in a lot of cells, doesn't move. TTC21B is a gene that has nothing to do with SEN1A, except the fact that it's its closest neighbor. It's right next 
to SCN1A on chromosome 2. So this is a control for proximity. No effect. I'm talking a lot about messenger RNA, but ultimately what we want to see is an effect on protein because the proteins are the workhorses. <clears throat> protein is harder to measure than messenger RNA, and that's why those uh, data are a little sparser. But here we see some cells, again, um, Dravet fibroblast. <clears throat> if you look at the top three panels, the first one where it says control, <clears throat> not a lot of staining, not a lot of protein being expressed. The middle one, CUR 1740, is another molecule of the same type, but it's the third one, CUR 1916, or CMP SCN001, as we now call it, at CAMP4, um, intensifies the staining, indicating more expression of the NAV11 protein. The bottom is, again, actin, a housekeeping gene that tells you a little bit about the shape of the cells, and as you can see, no change, no intensification of staining. <coughs> so, I already alluded to the fact that in mice models, we cannot use the human molecule, and that simply has to do with the fact that the mouse sequence is sufficiently different from the human sequence that <coughs> the two wouldn't pair with each other, they wouldn't bind to each other. So we have gone through the same exercise that's shown on the left, that's the mouse gene. We have found the mouse gnat, and then designed an appropriate antisense oligonucleotides, and then we tested this in the disease model. <coughs> Here are some very interesting data, I think. If you look at the left part, this is the amount of SCN1A upregulation in two different parts of the brain, occipital cortex, parietal cortex. And if you look closely, you can see that at doses of maybe 20, the upregulation goes from 1.0 to 1.25, 1.3, so 25% increase. That doesn't sound like a lot. However, at those same doses, five and 20, you can see that the seizure frequency goes down from about one to about three. So you upregulate the messenger RNA by 25%. That's not a whole amount, or not a whole lot. And yet the seizures go down by 70%. So again, <clears throat> very encouraging from the point of view that you don't really have to crank that dial all the way to the end. With a modest or moderate effect on gene expression, you can expect a, a pronounced therapeutic effect. Seizure threshold temperature, you're very well aware of the sensitivity of the Dravé brain to um, elevations in temperature. <coughs> the middle panel shows you that our mouse analog has no effect on the seizure threshold in healthy mice, which is something like 43.7 degrees anyway. If you look at the Dravé mouse, when treated with saline as control, it's around 40 degrees. After treatment with um, the mouse homologue, it goes up to about 41 and a half uh, degrees. So it makes the mouse more resistant to temperature-induced seizures, a feature that I think is very relevant for humans. <coughs> Finally, when we think about what neurons do, a lot of what neurons do is to generate electrical activity. <coughs> That's what EEGs are based on. And so on the left, you can see the electrical activity of specifically of the GABAergic neurons, which is where <coughs> the Dravé phenotype resides. And you can see under the, the, the picture that says wild type, um, as you stimulate these neurons, they have more electrical activity. <coughs> the Dravé mouse right next to it, not so much. Then the final panel there shows how we can reconstitute, at least partially, that electrical activity after treatment with the mouse analog. So I've shown you data about cell cultures. I've shown you data about uh, mouse. Now let's look at the monkey. <clears throat> so here I'm showing you upregulation of the SCN1A messenger RNA 
in the brain of non-human primates. And at this point, <coughs> because the monkey sequence is quite close to the human sequence, now we are using the human molecule. And you can see that by and large, in most of the regions we looked at, the upregulation is about <coughs> one and a half, sometimes two, two-fold. So enough to get somebody from 50% to probably close to 100%. <coughs> Here, we made a heat map of the actual concentration of the drug itself. So now, now, now we're not looking at upregulation of SCN1A, but the concentration of the gene itself. And your eye will get drawn immediately to the pink and purple. But actually, what I want to draw your attention to is that is a paler pink color over the rest of the brain. Because if you look from day 21 after dosing to day 42 after dosing, there's not a lot of difference in that part of the brain. <coughs> Which tells us that this drug, once it gets into the brain, stays there for a while. Which is exactly what we want to see because intrathecal injections is not something that you want to sign up for more than you strictly need to do. So the more we can space this out, the better it would be. These are brain concentrations. We have also seen the same thing in cerebrospinal fluid. <clears throat> the final data slide I want to show you is levels of that NAT, which is ultimately the target we want to bind to, in humans. Because a baby is not the same as a school-aged child, is not the same as a teenager, is not the same as an adult. And so we double-checked whether that target is really there throughout life. And it is, as you can see, the levels, <coughs> they go up and down a little bit, but by and large, they stay constant. Which again is encouraging because it tells us for a lifelong disease like Trave, there is no reason why we would not con could not continue to treat lifelong. So in summary, what we've learned so far is that the Dravet gene produces a net that downregulates expression we can and have designed an antisense oligonucleotides that counteracts this, <coughs> removes that breaking function, and increases messenger RNA levels. <coughs> a mild increase in those levels is already enough to have a noticeable and pronounced effect on seizures. You will tell me this is all very interesting, but where are you with this program? <coughs> So let me tell you about the current status of the program. So this program has gone through a couple of hands. We unlicensed it, it about a year ago, and we knew that the program needed a bit of an upgrade, a little bit of bringing up to date. So that's what we did. We're making a fresh batch of drug. <coughs> Excuse me. I assure you that this is seasonal allergies. It's become so suspicious to um, cough in public. So, licensed in the program and started dealing with the weaknesses that were identified. <clears throat> Making new drug, um, starting new toxicology studies, and engaging with the FDA. If you want to embark on something, it's always a good idea to get some feedback up front. And we did that a couple of weeks ago, and I, I can say it was successful. By and large, they agreed with what we were planning to do with our strategy had some very um, helpful feedback on <clears throat> technical details. And so we are now moving forward. We're doing all that work. We hope to file our IND late this year, early next year, and then start the single ascending dose in the first half of next year. On behalf of everybody at Camp 4, shown here in a very cold Massachusetts day, um, thank you for your attention. Please engage with us um, after, the, after the, the talk in the meeting rooms, but I would be happy to take your questions now. Do we have any questions? Okay, great, we'll write.
Hi, Lori Isom from University of Michigan. Thank you for your talk. I have two questions. One, what's the effect on spontaneous seizures in your mouse model? And two, um, is your the electrophysiology figure, what were those fast spiking interneurons? They're PV positive fast spiking interneurons in your electrophysiology figure. I'm sorry, is the question whether these were PV positive uh, interneurons? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, we have reprints of the paper where this has been published, uh, and we can make that available to you for technical detail. Okay, thank you. And what about spontaneous seizures? Same thing. They were the, uh, spontaneous seizures were also suppressed. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>